for coming today. Um, so just to make sure you're in the right place, uh, this is going to be a talk about um, human rights activism in Colombia uh, as a way to uh, enhance your Spanish skills. Uh, my name is Maria del Pilar Fal Muriel. I'm from Colombia. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology here in UNM. And I've been doing research in Colombia in, in, the, in this subject, human rights, activism, and peace uh, practices in Colombia for the last eight years. And so much of what I'm going to present is based on my observations or what I can recommend from my experience um, as a researcher there and an activist. So, um, uh, quickly, uh, this is kind of what we're going to cover today. Um, so first, why should you go outside of the classroom for educational experiences? Uh, why specifically Colombia as a site for human rights activism? And um, I'm going to explain two types of um, activism that is available to you. And also, um, at the, the last part of the presentation, I invited two um, NGOs who, uh, that work in Colombia. There are two um, US-based NGOs that do activism uh, protection of human rights in, um, in Colombia, and so they have agreed to um, join us through Skype to tell us about their work and uh, specifically about the process of getting involved with the organization. Um, so let's hope that all our um, uh, uh, Skype and all the you know, internet stuff works out and we can do that part. Okay, <laughs> so why why go outside of the classroom for education, right? So uh, basically, um, this is kind of my experience as a student. I started going um, outside of the classroom looking for more than what I was getting, right? So oftentimes in the classroom, we uh, talk about things kind of in an abstract term or uh, we um, kind of have some level of understanding about you know things that are big, right? Issues that affect all of us, like human rights, capitalism, exploitation, imperialism, racism, things like that. And we think we understand them. But once we get out of the classroom, we actually see them happening, right? Around us, in the communities that we visit, um, the people that we talk to, and so it, it gives us a different way of understanding, not just you know, logically or um, in analysis in the classroom, but actually from your personal experience and human interaction. Um, so this is another way of learning that oftentimes we don't acknowledge right, in a university setting. So um, another reason uh, is uh, that you know, one on one, uh, person to person, connection, right? It helps you develop those social skills that are not only going to help you while you're there doing uh, the work or the activism work, but also, you know, there, those are skills that you can transfer to other settings, um, you know, in school or in your professional lives after graduation. Um, and so this is also related to, like, my first point there, that through these experiences, we're going to not only understand these concept, concepts better um, at a kind of a um, theoretical level, but also we are able to improve our achievement in other settings. So for example, um, you know, using those uh, interpersonal skills to improve right, your performance in Spanish, or to understand how other systems like economic systems work so that you can apply it to your you know, economics class or something like that. Um, so it's not only kind of the, um, you're not only improving your knowledge or your experience on those things that are, you know, very obvious like your Spanish skills and knowledge of history or current events in Latin America, but, you know, there are other areas that you can um, uh, have achievement. Um, so 
in all of these are related, right? In relation to that, when you are abroad, of course, you're learning from other um, communities, other people, the things that you're observing. But what happens even at a more intense and deeper level is the knowledge that you gain about yourself, right? About your biases, about where you come from, and how um, you um, you're produced the way that you are right now, right? Not that it's not going to change, but it gives you an insight to where you come from and why you think the way you think. Sometimes we take these things for granted, right? Like our ideology or our values or our own history. And so when we're abroad, we're kind of put in a, in a place where we have to question all that. Um, and then also, these opportunities that start as um, volunteering or maybe an internship, uh, they don't just you know end there. You can, I've seen it uh, with a lot of people that I have volunteered with in Colombia as a human rights observer, is that they're able to um, go um, or transfer those skills and get right a job, a permanent job where they will be um, working as human rights uh, observers or human rights activists. So these are ways to get you know jobs, right? To uh, get experience, right? Even if you, if this is not your main um, idea of how you want to spend your life, um, it gives you that professionalization that all of the job, uh, you know, places where you're going to interview are going to ask, okay, yes, great, great, you have really good grades, and what else do you know how to do, right? So this is a way to get that professional experience. And lastly, but not less important, um, this is a way to contribute to really important issues of social uh, justice, right, and social change. Um, and you don't need to be an expert, you don't need to be um, fluent in Spanish, you don't need to be a grad student, you don't need to be a professor, you can do it from your own position and your own level of skills in Spanish um, as a student, you know, as who you are right now. And this is very important because a lot of people think, well, you know, that's like really, really um, serious work. It's impossible that I can do it as a student. In fact, most volunteers start as students, volunteering for short periods of time or doing internships as a way to learn about um, the uh, conditions in the country where they volunteer. Any questions about this or um, areas that you might want to discuss or agree <laughs> or disagree. You know, as I move on, just you know, wave your hand if you want to say something. Okay, it doesn't have to be a, a, a monologue. <laughs> um, so specifically, why Colombia as a site for human rights activism? Colombians, I don't know. I'm not going to give you uh, like a history lesson on Colombia. So just kind of these uh, bullet points to give, put it in perspective. But uh, Colombia has had a war for the last seven decades. So obviously, stemming from this internal conflict, uh, there are you know, many elements or many var um, variables that uh, produce an unstable and uh, violent uh, situation for a lot of the population. Um, specifically for communities of in indigenous uh, communities, Afro-Colombian communities, and uh, farmers. So these are the, the communities that are the most um, vulnerable in Colombia. So these are the, the people who are targeted for uh, human rights violations. And although we signed a peace accord, the national government signed a peace accord recently, only three years ago, in 2016, um, it, was only, it was signed only with one of the armed actors. There are multiple armed actors operating in Colombia, and so you know, this peace accord, which has been internationally um, acclaimed as being one of the best peace accords ever, uh, enter between an armed actor and a national government still has a lot of challenges. And, um, 
and, and a lot of aftermath that has been violent and has been targeted to those vulnerable populations that I mentioned earlier. So um, again, we have multiple illegal armed actors, right? These are either guerrilla groups or paramilitary groups. Uh, paramilitary groups act as proxies of the state with kind of permission of the state in, in cahoots with the state. Um, and so there are re there is research that shows that 70% of violence committed in Colombia is actually committed by the state. So this peace accord addresses um, violence uh, and crimes that happen in relation to one of the guerrilla groups named the FARC, and that's it. It doesn't cover, it doesn't address the violence stemming from the government, from the paramilitary groups, or from uh, other um, uh, armed groups. And so, you know, even though there is a peace accord, the situation is still not peaceful, right? Um, another thing that it's, it's aggravating this situation is that Colombia um, is one of the top countries, or is the most unequal country in Latin America in terms of access to land, or the, uh, the ability for people to hold onto a piece of land and say, this is mine. And so uh, this uh, data is really important. 80% of the land in Colombia is owned only by 1% of the population. Yeah. So it leaves 99% of the population in very precarious situations, right? And so these are the people who are uh, affected by armed conflict uh, because armed conflict causes displacement, right? Um, and so this displacement is basically um, perpetuated and promoted by the state because uh, when people move out of their land, this land basically, or the way that the government, or the state sees it, is this land is open for development. So what happens most often is that the land gets sold. Um, and then multinational corporations come in, or even national corporations come in, with different projects like mining or agricultural uh, mega projects, things like that. And this leaves us with 8 million people who have been displaced, which is the, the highest number of internally displaced people in the world. Um, okay, and another thing that aggravates the situation is um, that Colombia is uh, one of the 15 uh, countries that receives the most aid, aid from the US. And as you see here, the majority of that aid is for military purposes, right? And we mentioned before that the Colombian armed forces, the national armed forces, police and military, are the ones causing most of the violence. So here, there is kind of a direct link between what's happening in Colombia and us, us as US citizens, right? We are responsible for what our government is doing with our money, right? The money that, that our money that is destined to quote unquote help other countries, what is it really? Um, uh, invested in. So we need to um, question that and we need to be aware that maybe even if we haven't heard of Colombia before, if this is the first time, or maybe you have heard a different um, story about Colombia, this is very real. Our money is being used to perpetuate inequalities in Colombia and violence. Any questions or comments? Okay, um, so, you know, what to do about all of this, right? Um, not that one person is going to be able to solve all these complex issues, um, injustices taking place, but as an individual, we do have power to change things, to act, to um, have an impact on the situation that people live on a day-to-day -day basis. So this type of activism is short-term and it's called uh, delegations, right? So these are very short um, trips, about 15 to 10 days, 
sorry, 10 to 15 days, and it, they are educational opportunities. So you go to Colombia, um, you meet with communities and activists, you hear from their um, point of view how um, how the violence or how the conflict has affected them and their communities, right? And so um, after you hear all of this, right, this first-hand education, um, at the end of the trip, as a group, all the delegates, so the people who part oops, sorry, to participate, one second. Um, I'm still covering um, uh, some material, maybe like two more minutes, and then we'll okay. start. Okay, you call us and then? No, you can stay. It's just two more minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, so these short-term uh, visits, um, the purpose of them at the end is for you to, as a group, to uh, prepare a report, right, for the U.S. Embassy. As U.S. citizens, right, you share this information because oftentimes the U.S. Embassy representatives don't go to the places that us as delegates go. Uh, they say it's too, too unsafe for them, right? Um, but then, you know, we have, as the way I see it, we have that responsibility, right? As U.S. citizens, we can go there, we use that privilege of being a U.S. citizen to go to these places where even the U.S. government doesn't want to send their staff, right? And so our purpose is to go to the embassy and educate them about what we heard, what we saw. Um, and then the other purpose is when you come back to the country, um, to the U.S., that you keep engaged, right? That you do something with that knowledge. That's kind of the idea about being uh, an educational experience and a transformative experience, is that with that knowledge, you do something about it. And there are many ways of doing it, right? For example, my first visit in a delegation, um, when I came back, because I'm also a teacher, my first reaction was, well, well I need to create a class, right? A class that talks about these issues. Uh, but for you, as a student, it might be, I need to talk to my group of friends. I need to talk to my club. I need to go talk to my church, right? So this is the idea that with sharing this knowledge, we can actually contribute to social change. Oh, sorry, this way. <laughs> and then the next way of uh, being engaged, uh, maybe it's not going to be right now because you might not know much about Colombia right now, um, or you want to improve your Spanish skills uh, before committing to something like this, but this is long-term activism called international accompaniment. And uh, both of the organizations that we're going to talk today uh, provide this type of accompaniment. So this is longer time, um, usually between one to two years of commitment. So this would be great for you guys to, con to consider it as a maybe an internship, or even be if you're considering about going to grad school, uh, maybe before you go to grad school, you get this kind of uh, life experience, right? Before applying to grad school. Um, and so, um, Either you know, people who go uh, and do international accompaniment either live with one community uh, for the whole time um, or um, visit different communities throughout their service, right? And has kind of a base in um, a city and then travels to different parts of Colombia visiting communities. It really depends on the structure of the organization. So today you're going to hear uh, from two organizations with us for peace, which um, does this, uh, the, the first type of, or the second type of accompaniment, which is traveling to different communities. Here we have an ex-volunteer uh, from the organization that was serving as an, interpreting, as an interpreter for a delegation. And here we also have a volunteer from uh, for peace, uh, peace, uh, peace Presence, who uh, lived for two years in uh, one community uh, providing physical accompaniment. So um, I think I'm going to give it to uh, Sam and Evan from Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective.
to tell you guys about their work and also how you can in the future be involved with this organization. May I do? No, no, me uh, Oh, because you guys. Uh, oh yeah. Let's see. Okay, listo, bien. Okay, so oh, you know what? I'm gonna check and see if Emily is also connected. Oh, how do you do this? And you don't, you don't need our camera, right? Uh, it would be nice to have you there in the uh, with the camera from uh, peace uh, for peace uh, presence. Um, how about if maybe Emily, you can start by telling us a little bit about the work that you do. I just went over very quickly about long-term activism as international accompaniment. So maybe like what it is, like what people do on a daily basis when they're doing that, and like a way to get involved with four. Sure. Um, right. So. We are an international company organization. Um, we work here in Colombia, we work around the country. Um, we have a group of accompaniers. So we do both physical accompaniment and political accompaniment. Physical accompaniment means going out in the field and um, I don't know, we wear our shirts, we do what we call physical protection. And the political accompaniment is more um, on the advocacy side of things. So maybe we have meetings, we write letters, we reach out to our support network. Um, and so what else did you want to get to talk about? What, how um, can we get involved? Yeah, but maybe um, then let's talk, let's let Sam and Evan talk about what they do. And then at the end, you guys can like talk about those ways to get involved in both of the organizations. Great. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah. Hey, do you hear us? See. Awesome. Yeah, so we're um, a grassroots um, human rights organization. Um, we do a lot of solidarity work uh, in, in, very, in a variety of ways. Uh, we do popular education. I think Pilar was going a little bit over that um, through delegations. Uh, through speakers' tours, and then uh, another aspect of our work is also doing human rights accompaniment, physical and political human rights accompaniment. Yeah, and along with that, we do uh, all sorts of documentation work uh, here on the ground. So unlike, I think, for peace presence that accompany in one specific area or like in one particular community and have a permanent presence there, uh, we were based Bogota and we, we move throughout uh, the country uh, on a need to need basis or on a month to month basis, accompanying you know, humanitarian zones or different communities, different human rights defenders who are at risk. And we document some of the effects that uh, specifically United States foreign policy has on the movements uh, for peace and justice in Colombia. So, um uh, any of you guys could answer this. I have here as a description of what international accompaniment is as um, a way of using our privilege, race, class, and nationality for creating a possibility for a more just world. Do you guys have uh, comments about this? Like, why, why is this using our privilege and how we use it? Yeah, I mean, I think that that fits the, the definition that, that we use here, uh, which is already collected. Every, like, it's, it's about, yeah, using uh, our passport privilege, sometimes uh, our, our white privilege, and also the privilege of our, um, like, often linguistic skills that allows us to create bridges uh, between grassroots organizations in Colombia and powerful institutions that are having an effect on their lives or try and have those institutions respond to the threats that they're facing. But yeah, I think the idea of, of privilege and, and trying to leverage our privileges for uh, those who, uh, due to the injustices in our systems, uh, are often left behind or marginalized. And so 
many of us don't get to choose what privileges we're born with, but we do get to choose what we do with them. And I think international accompaniment is, is, is part of that. Yeah, so when, when we're in these communities that most often um, the, the, not even the national news reports on, when we're in these communities and they're being affected by violence or displacement, uh, then there's uh, certain attention that comes with us going to these places. So it raises their profile, and um, and then the government entities are more, more likely to do something about it. Emily, how about you? What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I I agree. I think that's a great definition. I think you guys explained it really well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, and um, so I don't know if you guys want to uh, maybe talk a little bit about. Um, how to get involved uh, with your organizations? Um, sure, can you hear? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there's many ways uh, to get involved. Uh, right now, hopefully tomorrow, I'll be leaving on, on a speaker's tour around the Midwest of the United States with a Colombian speaker, talking about some of the implementation of the Colombian peace process and how the United States government is influencing uh, the implementation phase, uh, and it's like going to probably determine whether it's successful or not, whatever the United States government uh, actions they take. So that's one is keeping uh, keeping track of those tours. Uh, this time it's in the Midwest, but like also thinking of hosting a speaker in your region uh, or at your university. Uh, in the future would be awesome. Also, we are having a delegation to Colombia traveling through Cauca, uh, exploring some of the, um, the environmental effects of US foreign policy uh, and the effects on grassroots movements that are fighting for environmental justice. In Cauca, that would be spring break 2020, so I think it's like February 28th to like March 7th or something like that. So, Keep an eye out for that. It'll be on our website very soon, and I can send Bilal. I can send you uh, like a flyer uh, for those interested. Um, that would be awesome if you can join us and see for yourself the kind of work that we're doing here on the ground. It's a very unique opportunity uh, to engage and interact with grassroots uh, organizations and human rights defenders who are on the ground uh, fighting for. Uh, the things that we all want, which is a sustainable climate and also cultural justice within that. And you can also donate if you're in the position to donate to, to our organization at our website. You can donate. Um, you can follow our newsletter. You can follow our social media. Yeah. Um, yeah, just if you want to sign up for our email list, uh, it's on our website. Uh, follow us on social media. Um, and yeah, just keep updated on, on our work. We're always trying to grow our base. And um, yeah, sometimes we, we do have uh, internship positions. Uh, right now, it's, we actually do have an intern. Um, so in Colombia, we currently don't have any open positions. But uh, sometimes we do. So we'll so keep an eye out for that. Uh, we also. We're having a vacancy in Honduras pretty soon. Um, so we're going to be looking to hire someone pretty soon. So if anyone's interested in solidarity work in Latin America with an emphasis on, um, on US policy, uh, that would be a great, a great fit. It's really, really cool work. And we, do, we get to, to meet with really awesome people. Emily? Um, yeah, I think there are kind of different levels of ways. It depends on how involved someone would want to be. There are easy things like, um, you know, following us on social media, signing up for newsletters, and then I think there are other ways that could be more involved. Um, sometimes we write letters to our Congress people. Sometimes we make phone calls so people could help out that way. Um, <coughs> I think. One little project maybe that is really possible and a really great way to um, 
teach other people about what's going on is organize um, an event where you could, you know, there'd be tons of little movies. You could show a movie, a little film. You could talk about what's going on in Colombia. Um, if that interests anyone, like, I'm sure we could, well, as and Witness for Peace, I'm sure we could share information and, and materials to do that. Um, so I think those are good ways to just kind of like raise awareness of what's going on. And um, like Witness for Peace is saying, we're always trying to grow our network. The bigger our network is and the more involved they are, the, the stronger that makes our work on the ground. So that's always really important as well. And yeah, I mean, if anyone has like ideas of ways they want to help out, also just shoot an email and, you know, we're open to many ideas. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, and I, we, all, we have a few more minutes, and so I wanted to ask uh, people here in the audience if they have any questions so that they get a chance to ask them to you guys. Anybody want to ask them? I mean, what does the physical accompaniment actually involve? Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, was the question, what does physical accompaniment? Yeah, like involve? what do what do you do when you're doing physical accompaniment? Well, it, it's a lot like what it sounds like. That you're uh, following or in either a community or uh, following a human rights defender, a human rights defender uh, that is under severe threat and you are documenting uh, the things that you are seeing. So just the presence of an international actor, in this case, is for peace, it's all very collective, but it could also be for, like, raises the stakes, it is that it raises the stakes for any potential aggressor, um, so that if anything were to happen in the presence of one of our organizations, we would quickly uh, document that in, in uh, communicate that to other international organizations and entities in our base and that there would be some kind of urgent action in response to any attack on that community or on that uh, human rights defender. So, so what type of activities do you do? I know there is a lot of walking involved, for example. So where did you go and why walking? <laughs> um, Right, so I just want to also mention another thing. We always are have a t-shirt or a vest or something on that identifies us so that the idea is that they know we're part of a network. We're not just some random person walking around. We're, you know, we're part of an organization. Um, yeah, I think walking around makes just makes you more visible. You don't know who... You don't know who is watching. You don't know, you know, who is kind of like checking out to see who's in the area. So as you're walking around with a brightly colored T-shirt on, um, that you know makes it known to other actors that you have that they they are protected, protected, and they have a, a presence um, that's there and watching what's going on. So. A lot of the things we also see in the field, we take and we do something with that. Some people will write an article later, or you know, talk, have a meeting about it with an embassy and talk about what we saw. So another thing is, you're obviously not just lucky, but you also need to be really aware of what's going on. And another really important thing is taking cues from the people that you're accompanying. Um, we don't go out and just walk anywhere we feel like going. We really listen to. The person that we're accompanying and take instructions from them since they're the people that know best um, what's going on in, the, in their region. Could you maybe talk about one of the communities or individuals that you accompany? That you accompany? Sure. Also, I wanted to add it, it's also um, uh, when we do physical accompaniment, it's moral support for the communities. Mm -hmm. Or the individuals that we're supporting. Um, so just letting them know that there's international attention, that people do care about the work that they're doing, that the work that they're doing is important. Um, and then for communities too, uh, who are oftentimes uh, abandoned by the state, 
uh, to let them know that they do matter, that their lives matter, um, and that they have international support. Um, yeah, we, uh, when it's for Peace Solidarity Collective, we um, accompany various communities based on requests from partners. Uh, so, for example, Yeah, Pichima Quebrada, this is like a, a, a river community in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there's a lot of state actors there, but there's not a lot of uh, government presence. Uh, the only government presence is in the form of uh, armed forces, so there's a lot of um, military presence, but no uh, state entities. And uh, uh, recently, an uh, indigenous community was displaced um, by clashes between two illegal armed actors in that area. Um, and so uh, one of our partners, one of our closest partners, Bustis uh, Paz, asked us to accompany them on a verification mission to verify the, um, the state of the community and if it was safe for them to return to their original community. Um, so we went um, last month and we did a verification mission and uh, let the community there know that there's international um, support and that we are going to be having meetings about this and writing about this. So recently we, we wrote an article, we wrote a report, but then we met with the embassy uh, up to, to report back on uh, what we saw and um, yeah, just to be a voice for the community since there a lot of times they don't have access to to these uh, actors, people, or government entities. So uh, this is the article that she um, just referred to. It's in the NACLA reports, um, and the title is "The Brink of Extinction in Colombia." So it talks about this um, indigenous community. <coughs> Um, that uh, Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective accompanies. Um, Emily, do you want to talk about uh, a community that you guys accompany? Um, sure. So we, well, we used to have a permanent presence in the peace community in San Jose, um, and this was where we, we had a group of either two or three volunteer accompaniers who were there on a permanent basis, so they lived there, they accompanied there, they were there 24 hours a day. Um, most people went for a year, uh, six months to a year, and they lived beside the community. And this is a farming community, so a lot of the accompaniments we did uh, was out in the fields when people went to plant their crops or maybe had to go walk somewhere. So a lot of it was very rural, um, which is obviously very different than a company that you might do with um, a human rights defender in the city, or maybe you'd be accompanying them to a meeting or something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this, this was a really unique experience because people you really got to know the, your neighbors and, and the community members. You saw them every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you became kind of like like a little family. Um, yeah. Um, do you guys have any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Is it safe? <laughs> and you obviously, you have to be physically fit to do these <laughs> programs, right? Are you doing a lot of physical activities? Did you hear the question? The question is, is it safe uh, for you as an accompanier? And um, do you have to be uh, physically fit to do this type of um, service? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the work that we do before we go uh, out and physically accompany is uh, security analysis. So we'll make phone calls, we'll talk to community members, we you know, do some research before so we know what's going on um, in the community at the time, and, and if the, the security conditions are being met. 
Um, oftentimes we write a, a letter or call um, different embassies or different um, state entities to let them know that we'll be going there and we will be accompanying. So we don't just go blindly, but a lot, a lot of the work we do is this initial security analysis that we know that, that conditions are safe for the accompaniers. And I mean, in, in the time that we've been accompanying, nothing's happened to an accompanier or someone that we're accompanying. So thus far, we feel like <laughs> the, the conditions are, or that our security analysis is working. Um, and regarding the questions about, about being physically fit, sometimes a lot of walking, but also the people that you're accompanying understand that you you come from a different background. Maybe, for example, if you're going to a rural area where you have to walk a long ways, they know maybe you're not used to that. Maybe you're not used to walking for that long or that far. So they're very understanding also of what your physical you know, the minutes or, or needs are. Yeah, I, I was given a, um, a mule okay. to get through rough <laughs> terrain, like in this yeah. guy here. Okay. <laughs> they yes. saw me and they're like, okay, okay. I'm getting the mule. This is far, but it takes you like twice as long as, as, as them. So, yeah. Yeah. no, they're very understanding. <laughs> right. Um, so we only have a few, a few more minutes, uh, maybe one or two minutes. And I was wondering if, um, you guys are seasoned um, activists already. You've had a lot of time in Colombia, but maybe you think about your first, like your first year, the first time that you did this work, and maybe kind of reflect on, uh, or maybe give us some like words about like, okay, how do we overcome maybe that fear of okay, I'm just a student. What, how, how would I be able to do all that? Like, kind of reflect on um, where you started, right? Yeah, I think yeah, I think uh, sometimes during during uh, this work, I do reflect on on that a lot. Of thinking, you know, just a year and a half ago, I was sitting in a classroom, just like you probably are right now, and yeah, it was hard to think that I would be doing this kind of work in Colombia uh, at that time, but. It, you know, people really do rise to the challenge and you'd be surprised at what you're capable of. And it's like, I don't know, this experience has been so so energizing for me because you start to meet people who are undergoing and, and doing these ex extraordinary things. And to be a part of that is just such a privilege. And so um, you start to want to uh, do more and, 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 and you know learn more and be just like a better advocate for all these things. So, yeah, you'll find the motivation. And I know it's kind of crazy to think that maybe one day you'll be doing this, but that's what I thought too, and here I am. <laughs> and I really, really enjoy it. And um, I would encourage anyone to, to think outside the box and to think, but maybe this is a possibility for you. And to, or, you know, and start thinking about how to use uh, your privileges uh, for, for the betterment of society, for, you know, the construction of a better world. Thank you, Logan and Sam and Emily. Our time is um, ending, so I really appreciate you guys uh, logging in and sharing your experiences and your knowledge, and hopefully we'll be in, 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 uh, in contact soon. Gracias. Thanks, Pilar. Thank you. All right, bye. 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 Thank you guys for coming today. Um, if you have any questions, please contact me. Um, I have here two flyers. One is about the study abroad program in Colombia. Uh